Yay, everybody. Welcome to our Paleo Fast Student Symposium. Josh Matthews will be leading our discussion with several really amazing people that are here. So um, please be, feel free to put your comments in the chat section and we'll address those comments in the discussion. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Josh Matthews. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, welcome to Berkeley Museum's uh, 2022 Paleo Fest. Um, we've been, well, in life, we've been absent for two years, but we did virtual last year, which which worked pretty well, but it's really good uh, for, for the, the event here to be in person. I'm glad you were able to uh, join us virtually. Uh, we got a great series or a great uh, panel of speakers here today uh, from across the country and, and working on very different aspects of uh, paleontology. So we're going to start. We're just going to uh, work down the line and everybody's going to give a little uh, introduction about who they are, what they work on, um, and where they work. And um, I guess I might as well just start out with myself. I'm Josh Matthews. I'm the director of paleontology here at the Burpee Museum of Natural History. Um, I've been a part of the Burpee since 2004 as a volunteer, and I've been director of paleontology for about five years now. Um, my work primarily uh, in the health formation of, of southeastern Montana and the Morrison formation of uh, Utah. Uh, we have two, those are our two main areas we work here at Burpee. Uh, we have a large sauropod dominated bone bed, so the long neck dinosaurs in Utah. It's called the Hanksville Burpee Dinosaur Quarry. We have at least 20 dinosaurs, or parts of 20 dinosaurs, in this quarry. Um, most of them sauropods, large animals, you know, one upper thigh, one leg bone is about four, four to five feet long, which is a big animal, but still not adults, so they get bigger. Um, in Montana, we work in the Hell Creek Formation, which is where you find your Tyrannosaurus rex and your Triceratops and the big armored and Kylos. So, uh, we for about 20 years and we worked Josh, I'm going to try to switch your microphone. Right. I think that's a little better. All right, so um, I'm, tr I'm currently at Northern Illinois University trying to finish up my PhD. Um, I'm looking at the geology of the Hell Creek Formation in southeastern Montana, and I'm looking at microvertebrate fossils. So. Underneath the di uh, dinosaurs are cool. Everybody loves the dinosaurs, but underneath underneath their feet, there are all kinds of, of smaller animals. You get uh, the amphibians, you get snakes, you get lizards, you get crocodiles, you get mammals, you get all kinds of various other animals living alongside the dinosaurs. So I'm looking at these little fossils and I'm seeing how they change through time uh, from the base of the Hell Creek Formation to the top of the Hell Creek Formation, which is a geological unit, so a package of rocks about uh, 400 to 500 feet thick. And I represents about a million and a half years of deposition. And I'm seeing how these communities change through time up until that, that asteroid hit the Earth and essentially wiped out the dinosaurs. So um, those are our main programs that we work on here at the Berkeley Museum. So and we'll be talking a little bit about that today. I'm going to uh, on my left here and I'm going to introduce uh, Kirsten Formoso. And she's going to tell you a little bit about herself. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. Um... So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kirsten Formoso. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I am also a graduate student in residence at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County in the Dinosaur Institute there. And I am a vertebrate paleontologist. I study um, uh, the fossils of marine mammals and marine reptiles because I'm interested in how they evolve to go into aquatic environments from their land environments. So these animals, reptiles and mammals, all have terrestrial or land-based ancestors. And so they were moving around, locomoting on land. And so I'm specifically interested in asking if how they locomoted on land impacted the way they evolved into aquatic environments. If something walked the way a mammal walks, think about the way a dog or a horse or a sheep or a cow walks on land, that's very different from the way a uh, lizard walks on land, like a lizard or um, things like a gecko, bearded dragons um, move with kind of sprawling locomotion with a lot of bending in their spine. Uh, I'm interested in if those different types of ways that these animals moved on land um, controlled or, um, yeah, controlled or impacted the way they could evolve into aquatic environments. And so some of my study animals are going to be a lot of groups that we have alive today, like whales, manatees, and pinnipeds, which are seals, sea lions, and walruses, and their fossils, and then a whole slew of extinct marine reptiles that lived alongside dinosaurs, such as mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, uh, ichthyosaurs, and even marine crocodilians and animals like that. 
So that's <coughs> what I study, so locomotion and things like that. And uh, I look forward to answering your questions today. Thanks for tuning in. Awesome. Thank you, Kirsten. And next we'll move on to Amelia Zietlow. All right. Hello, my name is Amelia Zietlow. I am a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Um, so if you've seen the United Museum movies, it's that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I work primarily on mosasaurs, which are a kind of marine reptile. They're specifically um, marine lizards. So some, imagine basically a Komodo dragon with flippers and a shark tail. Um, and what I study in mosasaurs is how how their bones are shaped the way they are. So how they, the, the shapes of the bones have changed over a long period of time throughout different species or over evolution, as well as how the bones are different among different kinds of mosasaurs or um, rather different individuals of the same species. So changes in the bones due to how old they are or whether they're male or female or that kind of thing. Um, and I study them by comparing different mosasaurs to each other, but also comparing them to their living relatives, things like snakes and monitor lizards and iguanas and things like that. All right, thank you, Amelia. We're gonna move on to Dr. Joe Sertich, who will also be our keynote speaker tomorrow night here at PaleoFest. Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Joe Sertich. I am the curator of dinosaur paleontology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So I'm ideally situated out west in the Rocky Mountain region for digging dinosaurs. And my research focuses on dinosaur ecosystems from the Cretaceous, although I've dabbled in other time periods like the late Jurassic. Um, I've been able to work all over the world. So I've worked in places like Madagascar, East Africa, Antarctica. Uh, but it's closer to home that I do most of my work. And so I research dinosaurs from the end of the Cretaceous, um, not the very end, so not T-Rex and Triceratops, but the ancestors of those dinosaurs. So I work on early tyrannosaurs, early horn dinosaurs, so the really amazing diversity of different types of horns and frill shapes, uh, and even the duckbill dinosaurs, which I think people think are often a little bit boring, but they have a lot to teach us. They're pretty cool animals. Um, so I'm really interested in dinosaur ecosystems and I love going out and discovering uh, dinosaurs, dinosaur ecosystems, spending time in the field, digging them up. All right, thank you, Dr. Serge. Uh, we move on with Dr. Casey Holliday. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Casey Holliday. I'm a professor of anatomy at the University of Missouri. Um, I don't get to go dig up dinosaurs all too often, but what happens is uh, Joe here will dig up a really sweet skull, and then I get to come in later and figure out where all the soft tissues actually go inside of them. So I figure out where jaw muscles attach and everything, like in dinosaurs and crocs and birds and those kinds of stuff. Also work on brains and eating nerves. And, and I'm talking about um, blood vessels actually this week and how dinosaurs use blood vessels in the tops of their skulls to kind of control their body temperature. And so we can learn all sorts of things about how dinosaurs work by kind of understanding their anatomy and reading some aspects of their bones sometimes. And this requires me to also then work on, work on lots of live animals like crocs and birds and lizards and things. So cool. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dr. Holliday. And last but not least, Scott Williams. Hi, my name is Scott Williams. I'm currently the interim director of exhibits at Museum of Rockies and the Paleontology Lab and Field Specialist in Bozeman, Montana. Um, I've been doing paleontology now for 22 years. Uh, I got my start here at Burpee uh, and with Josh and others helped to start the paleontology program here. was part of the team that found Jane, the juvenile T-Rex, Homer, the Triceratops, and uh, several other really cool specimens here. Um, at Museum of the Rockies, I've done a lot of, uh, a lot of work in uh, various geologic formations, including the Hell Creek Formation, which you've heard several other folks mention here. Uh, which records the very end of the age of dinosaurs 66 to 67 million years ago where you get Tyrannosaurus rex, and Triceratops, and Edmontosaurus, Ankylosaurus, and so on. Uh, also doing a lot of field work in the Judith River Formation and uh, the Bear Paw Formation, which uh, are a little bit older than the Hell Creek by about 10, 10 million years or so, and a little bit in the Two Medicine where the famous uh, Egg Mountain site uh, is known from. Uh, I've done other work in uh, Oklahoma and uh, here in Illinois, uh, quite a bit of uh, fossil collecting here uh, in our middle Ordovician uh, limestones. So I'm a bit of a generalist. I, as Joe mentioned, I really into paleo ecosystems, uh, basically kind of the faunal diversity of the different kind of animal plants and animals that uh, 
we're living at this time. Um, I like to collect. I like to collect fossils, and I like to uh, talk about them and put them on exhibit so people get excited about Earth's history, but also about science. All right, thank you, Scott. You're done, Josh. Go ahead, keep going. Okay. So, uh, just uh, <clears throat> lost my train of thought here. <laughs> so, uh, Paleo Fest here in, in Burpee, at Burpee Museum. This is our 24th year doing Paleo Fest, and uh, when most people think about paleontology, I think dinosaurs come to mind. Um, but one of the things we pride ourselves on here at Paleo Fest is we try to get people from every different walk of, uh, of paleontology. So paleontology is the study of past life. Um, it's not just dinosaurs. Dinosaurs tend to be cool. We all love them. Um, at some point in our life, I think we almost every one of us has loved dinosaurs or wanted to be a paleontologist. Um, however, we, we, we been, bring people in to talk about things from fossil fossil pollen, you know, po pollen that are on plants. If you've ever been out in the spring uh, time and, and you're sneezing and you're sneezing, that's because pollen's getting in your nose and, and causing you to sneeze. So pollen fossilizes in the fossil record. We can find tons of it. So from the tallest or the smallest grain of pollen to invertebrate uh, fossils, to uh, leaves, to, to wood, to dinosaurs, to mammals, to reptiles, amphibians, um, this all incorporates paleontology. So when we when we put the speaker list together for Paleo, or Paleo Fest, we try to grab aspects of all different kinds. As Dr. Holliday was talking down here, talking about down here, he studies soft tissue, uh, soft tissues in dinosaurs that typically doesn't preserve, but we can uh, by using modern modern animals, we can infer where where muscle attachments go and and reconstruct these animals. So. Um, the panel we put together today here are mostly vertebrate paleontologists. I'd, I'd say with exception of, of Scott has done some invertebrate uh, work as well, with trilobites um, in the area as well. So it's it's a very diverse field. Um, one thing a lot of students uh, ask, or a lot of people in general ask, is how do you become a paleontologist? And I think I'm going to uh, ask anybody here on the panel, you know, what, what was your journey into paleontology? I mean, what did you guys study? Um, to become a paleontologist, and did you always want to be a paleontologist? Because some, I, I know, I know lots of folks who are you know brilliant paleontologists, but they never really <coughs> intended to become a paleontologist until they got into college. So, um, what, what are your guys' thoughts about what is your journey? What what should you study? So I'll just in order maybe. So I. I would say, yes, I've always wanted to be a paleontologist. My mom tells me that the first job I ever said that I wanted was paleontologist, though as I got older, I didn't think it was a real job. Um, and so then I went to college to be an evolutionary biologist. Um, and I my major was in ecology, evolution, and natural resources. And so I had every intention of being an evolutionary biologist, so looking at um, molecular and, and genetic uh, evolutionary relationships with that. But then a lot of my advisors and professors uh, in my undergrad, um, they told me like, oh no, paleont you could be a paleontologist you know, from this. Like I have colleagues and friends who are paleontologists, this is where they are. And so I, I would say I've always been biologically minded. I was good in my bio classes in, in high school and then college, of course. And that's kind of how I got to uh, where I was. But there are many, so many directions you could take. So right now my PhD will be in earth sciences when all is said and done, even though my undergrad degree is more ecology and evolution focused. So that's uh, that was my my particular path. It's not very geology, very bio oriented. Um, so I, I remember very early, like always, you know, liking dinosaurs, liking that kind of thing. But I remember deciding, like, I don't want to be a paleontologist. I don't want to go dig in the dirt in a hot place. That doesn't sound like any fun at all. Um, so I never planned on doing it. And when it came time to choose a college, actually, my plan A was to become a pilot because I really like airplanes and there's jobs. Um, so I picked a school that had a business program because I could make money to pay for flight school because flight school is expensive. Um, but they also had this this paleo program like, oh, that'd be fun because I like animals. I'll just do bio on the side and paleo will just be a fun thing. Um, and the business major was gone almost immediately because they started us with the biology classes. And I think my third year or so was when I really started taking like the paleo focused classes. And it took yeah, my advisors telling me like, no, there are there are jobs you can do it if you if it's what you want to do um, for me to wind up on that path <laughs> well for me uh like i think everyone on this panel i've always loved fossils i've always loved dinosaurs i was a huge dinosaur geek as a little kid um i never grew out of it i think everyone who knows me would still call me a dinosaur geek 
but it wasn't really until I got into college and started to take geology classes, so rocks and understanding earth history, that I started to seriously think about pursuing this as a career. And it was really just my first exposure to going out and looking at rocks and understanding how to read them so you can actually read them kind of like a book, a history book, and go back in time. And so that combined with my desire to collect. I love to collect. I have always loved collecting. I was able to combine into this really cool career where I get to go out and read the rocks to find fossils and collect them for museums so that we can all study them. Awesome. All right, Scott. Oh, Casey. Oh, Casey. <laughs> Just kidding. You can skip me. No, 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 no. no. I, I wasn't really, I mean, I, I, I saw the skeleton of a giant ground sloth. I wasn't really into paleo growing up, um, but I like poking at dead animals on the side of the road a lot. So I was an anatomist. And um, I couldn't decide if I wanted to be a veterinarian, marine biologist, or ultimately a paleontologist in college. And for the longest time, I actually worked as a veterinary technician and worked in a museum trying to figure out what I'd like to do more. And I ultimately decided I like dead animals a lot and trying to figure out how they worked and how they're built. And that means that I can study living animals as well as fossilized extinct ones. And that's what got me into paleontology. Thanks, Casey. Um, I think I probably have one of the more non-traditional routes uh, into paleontology. Um, like most uh, people who talk here, um, my interest in paleontology started when I was a kid. Uh, partly because my father would read me books, bring home dinosaur books, things like that. And then I can vividly remember going to my first museum, which actually wasn't Burpee. It was uh, the Field Museum in Chicago. I was taken there, and I remember seeing the Apatosaurus, which at that time was labeled Brontosaurus, um, in the old paleontology halls. And here's this 80-foot-long, long neck, four-legged, long-tailed dinosaur that's as big as a house. And I sat there for what I thought was hours, but I was like five or six, so it was probably like 30 seconds, but it felt like hours, thinking like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. How did this animal live? How did it move? It's, it was just, I can't imagine something this huge walking by me. And so I became more interested. I made my dad get me more books. Any museum, uh, so for, for some teachers, you might remember what 555-1212 uh, is that's the phone number that was basically uh, information. So anytime we would go anywhere, my mom would call that number and say, what are your museums in this area? And we would do a trip out to Nebraska, Colorado, Utah, et cetera. And so I just became more and more interested. I started coming to Burpee and I started volunteering as a kid. I was 13. I volunteered here for I don't know, seven or eight summers helping with the collections, helping do whatever, take care of the live reptiles that we had. Started college with the intention that I was going to become a paleontologist. And when you go into paleontology or you, you want to become a paleontologist, there's things that you should be strong in if you're looking to get an academic degree um, or at least be able to pass these classes. <laughs> um, and it's math, uh, sciences, chemistry, uh, biology, um, physics, things like that. And uh, I kind of meandered when I went to college. And I took these courses and I enjoyed some of them and some of them I did. And I ended up uh, becoming a police officer of all things. And I was a police officer for seven years. Uh, but I still volunteered and, and stayed in touch up here. And then in 2000, the former curator and I came out to Montana. We were invited out to see if we wanted to start a paleontology program for the museum. And I can remember sitting next to a Triceratops femur that we had found, looking out over the Hell Creek Formation, the Badlands, and it's like a hammer hit me in the head saying, this is what you wanted to do the whole time. And so I started to make a course correction. Uh, we came out in 2001 on our own as a museum, and it was volunteers and staff from Burpee. We had permits to look for dinosaurs and collect and that's when we found Jane, uh, the juvenile T-Rex that's here, and a lot of other cool things. And uh, the next year, we came back to excavate Jane, and when we uncovered Jane's skull, and I saw Jane's jaw right in front of me with all the teeth in it, I looked up and said, I'm quitting being a cop. And uh, <laughs> I called my dad, said, I'm quitting. And uh, he said, no, 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 slow down, slow down. 
and <clears throat> it doesn't work that way. So um, fortunately, because Jane was such an important find, the burpee found itself in a position where they could bring on more staff. Um, and so I was hired to build a lab and help build a collections. And um, I ended up going back to school. Um, and from there on, it just added, you know, I added more responsibility here and then ended up eventually moving on to Museum of the Rockies. So um, I would tell those out there that there are a lot of different routes you can get into paleontology. It doesn't necessarily have to be either field related or academic or research. You can be a fossil preparator, a collections manager. There's all these other routes you can go. Some of the best fossil preparators that I know who can outclass me in any way have art backgrounds. And they're, they are tremendous. So just know that there are several other avenues. It's not just playing in the dirt. Uh, it, there are metal medical technologies being used, computer technologies. Paleontology is an integrated science that relies on many other sciences in the field of health. So for those of you out there who are thinking about this, there are several different ways to get into it, and I certainly hope that you uh, you explore those. Right, and kind of end up dovetailing off of that. I mean, education is good. If, if you're going to go the education route, you're going to want to take classes in geology and bio biology. I mean, you need to know the anatomy of these animals, how they work, how they go together, but you also need to know how to put it in a geological context. Um, how old they were, uh, where they lived, what was the environment. Um, once you get to a certain point in the right age, if you have a natural history museum near you, volunteer. Um, that is the best way to get started, I think, if, if it's available to you. That's how I started out. I, I started out volunteering here one day a week for three hours almost 20 years ago. Um, and I was, an, I was a master's student working on something entirely different. I always wanted to be a paleontologist, but I had kind of similar to Scott, just a meandering route. It wasn't a direct path from A to B. Um, I did. I wasn't in the paleontology pipeline, so to speak. I didn't know any vertebrate paleontologists, especially dinosaurs. Um, so I took a class at, at Northern Illinois University in paleontology, and the professor there told me about Burby Museum. So I contacted Scott at the time and said, hey, I'd like to test my hand at fossil preparation. And I did, and it just kind of snowballed from there the following summer. I went uh, after we opened the Jane exhibit. Scott put together a, a small team to go out to the Hell Creek, and that was my first expedition out there. That's where we found Homer, our Triceratops upstairs, where I eventually turned into my master's thesis. And then it just, you know, it just, it was very, very serendipitous to, to, a, to an extent. Um, and when Scott moved out to Montana, I was able to uh, take over the program. So it's, but it all started by volunteering. If I had never started volunteering here, I honestly don't know where I'd be today. Um, so it's a way to get your foot in the door, start making connections, uh, and, and just meeting people. I had a lot of paleontologists that I'd look up to as a, as a, as a kid. And, you know, they know the burpee because of Jane. And the, these paleontologists started coming here, and I got to meet them. Scott introduced me to a number of most paleontologists I know right now. So, um, and that, that opens, you, opens your world up to any possibilities within paleontology. And again, it's not just dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are cool, but there's all kinds of cool things out there to study. Um, look at the rocks around where you live, around Rockford and, or Illinois, or Rockford and Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin. We have fossils everywhere. There are trilobites <clears throat> and brachiopods and crinoids. Um, they tell a story about life here on Earth at a certain point in time. So it's all, it's all, it's all interesting. So read, read the, the internet. You got un, un, don't read the internet. Not so <laughs> <laughs> read books. Read selective but, parts with of the, the internet. internet. You have, you know, it's true, unlimited resources at hand to, to, to figure figure out what you like, what you want to study, and that will change too. You may start out studying one thing, and then take a hard right in, some, in a completely different path. Who knows? Um, so just just read, and 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 talk to people, and get involved with the museum if you're able to. You know, questions have been coming through kind of slow, um, and I'm wondering if we can't get people revved up by talking a little about this movie series that a lot of paleontologists have opinions on. Um, do I dare talk about the Mosasaur that made a grand entrance? Oh, yes. Great. So me, me and Amelia will we'll take the Mosasaur. I would like to preface this by saying I love these movies. I I don't even care. People, I have so many friends and colleagues, potentially some here even, who are like, oh, these movies are so inaccurate. I hate them. I don't. I actually love every single Jurassic movie, though there are absolutely flaws. And so as someone who studies marine reptiles, 
the Mosasaurus, which I'm really grateful for. And I was able to actually tell the director directly how much I appreciate him putting a Mosasaurus in it because now the public knows what a Mosasaur is. And I wouldn't say that that was very common before. Um, so, you know, with that said, things it got right. So we'll start positively. It got, you know, the row of palatal teeth. So it got this, you know, lizards, um, or at least lizards that are related to Mosasaurus have a second set of teeth on the inside of the mouth. Um, should have had a forked tongue, it didn't. Um, and, and we're pretty confident that it would have given where it is in the lizard family tree. And the most glaring thing for me who studies locomotion is that it doesn't have a tail fluke. So Amelia wants to hold up her mosasaur. Um, and she's not on camera right now yeah, in a moment. But um, I'm going to fix it. Sorry, sure, I was sure. trying to pull some Jurassic no, don't worry, mosasaurs. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so it's and it's also grossly oversized. But I won't keep talking because Amelia can take the rest of it for the mosasaur. So here's the little tail fin. Yeah. Okay. So you can see how it's kind of shaped like a shark's tail. And we actually, we know that for two reasons. We know it because first, if you look at the actual vertebrae on the tail, they like change direction. So they- Did they you maybe turn your mic off? Oh, oh, oh it's on, it's on, it is on. It's on? What? Go ahead, we it's got on. you, oh. you're happy. Okay. Um, so anyways, the vertebrae, when they, they point backwards for a while and then they stick straight up and they kind of face forward and then they face backwards again. So at that point where they're facing up, that is to support that tail fin. And also there's this one fossil from Morocco that actually has the outline of the shark's tail like shape, um, which is super cool. So, but the Mosasaur in the movie does have kind of a paddle shape going on. So it's better than nothing. Um, I say my biggest problem, <laughs> there he is. I, I love it though. Like, just like Kirsten said, like, I love these movies. I don't care if they look wrong because like the important thing to me is that they're getting people aware of these animals. And if people want to learn more, they'll go to the museum and they'll learn more. Um, and I have, I do uh, Skype a scientist sessions pretty often where I zoom into classrooms and talk about my work. And in every single class, there's always a kid who loves Mosasaurs and it is because of this movie. So very happy about that. I think my only, if I had to pick one thing I was bothered by is that they gave it like crocodile skin because mosasaurs <coughs> are not crocodiles, they are lizards. They're not crocs, they're not dinosaurs. They are literally Komodo dragons with flippers. Basically. And we know what their skin looks like. We and have we know, skin impressions. Right, yeah. exactly. We know that they had little diamond shaped scales with little peels on them to help them move through the water. So yeah. I wish that Tom Holtz was here because he and I have a PowerPoint presentation about Jurassic Park versus Jurassic World, uh, which is quite amazing. Um, so um, he actually he actually put this into like a phylogenetic matrix on what the zeros and ones. Oh, your batteries. It's am okay. I, am I dying? Yeah, which, it's just your batteries. Which, how, many, how many things Jurassic Park got right versus how many things Jurassic World got right? Switch. I turned him up so that he didn't get interference. We're good. We're good. Go, go, go. Hello. Um, and what's fun is, at least for the first two Jurassic World movies, when you compare the number of actual uh, dinosaurs that we see or if animals that we see, um, Jurassic Park, the first movie, even though it's 30, is 30? 30 years? Oh my God. I'm so old. Um, even though it's 30 years old, gets more right than the first uh two jurassic world movies when it comes to accuracy on the dinosaurs subtle things like if you remember in the first uh jurassic park movie when they're trapped in the in the kitchen and the velociraptor puts its nose up to the window is looking in and then it breathes on the window and you see the condensation from the heat coming out of it that is a that's a really subtle thing to show you that velociraptor is warm-blooded it's an endotherm which is really cool. And the first set of Jurassic Park movies do a pretty good job linking birds to dinosaurs. I mean, they kind of almost hammer it in the head, hammer you in the head. So in the early 90s, this is a really kind of, you know, for, for many paleontologists, we already knew this, but for for the general public, this is their kind of their first exposure to see that dinosaurs and birds are close related. Dinosaurs, many dinosaurs were uh, endotherms, in other words, they maintain their own body temperature. Um, and I felt that they kind of got away from that a little bit in the first couple of Jurassic World movies. It certainly looks, based on the trailers, that this next Jurassic World movie is moving back towards that, which is really cool. Um, but just to, just to give you an idea 
on how long uh, a stereotype that is seen in those movies, the first one, Jurassic Park in particular, still informs the general public today. I've got two examples. How do you stop, or how do you not get eaten by a T-Rex? Don't move, because it can't see you if you don't move. I'm going to tell you that is bubkis. Um, T-Rex had really good eyesight. It had the largest eye of uh, any of the dinosaurs. It had uh, what we call stereoscopic vision, basically overlapping fields of view, like an eagle, or like us, like we're able to look down our nose and see, basically, kind of, there you go. Um, see, if, we, if you were to close one eye, right, and let's say we close our left eye, you can still see to the left a little bit with your right eye, right? And you can do the same thing by closing your right eye. So T-Rex has really good eyesight. So standing there being still isn't going to stop you from me being swallowed. Um, you know, the other thing is T-Rex had an excellent sense of smell, would have smelled you. Uh, but I, in reality is T-Rex probably wouldn't care about you because T-Rex was 40 feet long, weighed eight, nine tons, and you wouldn't even be an hors d'oeuvre for a Tyrannosaurus rex to probably walk by you. Um, the other thing is the Dilophosaurus, and that's the dinosaur that spits the venom and has the frill for the neck. We don't have any evidence that it had a frill for neck, but to this very day, I'll have adults come up to me who saw the Jurassic Park movie in 93 and say, oh, so T-Rex, you just don't move, or what about that dinosaur with the frill? So real popular movies like this have a long lasting hold on the general public's imagination. So that's where we come in, the, the gripers, and uh, <laughs> tell people, unfortunately, like I had to tell a kid during a tour some years ago that there was no such a thing as an Indominus Rex. And I thought the kid was going to like cry. Oh, you know, yeah, it was like I'm... tears welling up <laughs> and the whole thing. I said, but there are other super cool dinosaurs that are actually cooler. And I talked to the, them about Anzu and the uh, Oviraptors and uh, Dinochirus and all the other weird dinosaurs that we don't need to invent because they actually existed. We, we've actually had them just straight up not believe us. We're like, okay, yeah. but where is the Indominus Rex? I'm like, we don't have any here. They didn't exist. They were created for the movie. Like, okay, but where are the fossils? They just, some of them won't, don't believe it. So, what about um, the Velociraptors? Oh, I love the Jurassic Park three raptors so much. Is it, am I on? Are these ones? Yeah, you're on, girl. Um, the, the previous one. Um, I actually hate that they kind of went back to the Jurassic Park one one. These ones are phenomenal. They had round pupils uh, like an eagle. They tried with the quill colors. There was clear um, dimorphism between the male and female forms. Um, I, I really I really like the Jurassic Park three raptors for the time, the effort that they put in. Like you can tell. They were actually trying with the science um, and then, you know, let's say Jurassic World kind of regressed and the portrayal of the raptors, you know, slit eye, very reptile like. But it's in Jurassic, you know, it's in the uh, it's in the franchise that some more accurate raptors are. And I think the upcoming movie, given the trailer, is going to finally give us a feathered raptor. Um, so not, not, not a spoiler. It's in the trailer. So we'll see how it's portrayed in the next movie. So. But I, I think another issue with the Velociraptor is the size. That's the. I have I have a, a close friend of a friend of mine now who once I told him how big a Velociraptor really was, he he holds that against me now because I ruined his image of of what Velociraptor was. They're not the size they are in Jurassic Park. The ones in Jurassic Park were actually modeled off. I, I've always heard Deinonychus, but some yeah. say Utah Raptor as well. Um, so which are large bodied raptors, but Velociraptor has a cooler name. <laughs> so true for most people. So Velociraptors are really cool animals, but they were significantly smaller. Uh, than the than the animals you see in Jurassic Park. So we have a fossil of a uh, Velociraptor. At, oh, so, yes. oh, so we have a fossil of Velociraptor at the American Museum. That's like it's like the whole skeleton. Yeah. It's curled up on a block. It's super cute. It's like huggable size. Yeah. Like, Aww. It's like like uh, like a turkey size. Like I know they in the movie I, the I line is six foot turkey, but no, no, a regular turkey size. Turkey is turkey. Roughly what a Velociraptor was actually. Scott, I want to talk about the pterosaurs. Oh, oh, we got. Yeah. But, right. Can you loop in the question that we've got on the bottom there too? Oh yeah. Someone okay. asked what when mosasaurs are from. Mosasaurs are from the uh, 
Cretaceous, late Cretaceous. Yeah. Good. Oh, good. And then we got a fifth grader. Thank you. A fifth grader who wants to know if dinosaurs were as smart as the movies make them seem. Um, they couldn't do calculus. We can say <laughs> that. Um, so, di so dinosaurs probably, uh, I think I, I read that some of our dinosaurs like Troodon, which is a relative of your raptor dinosaurs, um, may have had, based on its brain size, um, uh, you know, intelligence of a dog. Looking down the, I'm looking down the aisle if that's what, uh, based on brain brain size and brain, brain volume. So they certainly, I mean, they certainly were active animals. They weren't the way they were portrayed when I was a kid, which was just laying around in swamps. And the reason they went extinct was because they were dumb and uh, couldn't compete with the mammals and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, what, what we see here in this image here is, you know, active moving fleet-footed some of them were animals that were gregarious uh had social structure lived in herds or maybe small small hunting groups packs things like that certainly we have evidence that that um dinosaurs some dinosaurs at least took care of their young so the way we look at dinosaurs is completely different than 40 years ago um but uh in the jurassic world movies jurassic park one of the things i want to talk about is the uh the flying reptiles which are again not dinosaurs they are related to dinosaurs but they're not dinosaurs but in jurassic park 3 you see a big flying reptile called a pteranodon it has teeth in the movie and it does not have teeth in the real world um you know harassing the kid in jurassic park 3 and then in jurassic world uh you see these flying reptiles trying to fly off with baby triceratopses and people and all this kind of stuff they absolutely could not do that. Um, I have to tell you, if a pteranodon with a 24-foot wingspan, you know, walking along with, you know, probably six, seven feet tall came up and harassed me, I would punch it out. I would knock it out with my fist like this because the bones on a pteranodon are paper thin. They're so thin and they are so weak, there's no way they could pick up uh, 150, 100 pound person, and that their feet aren't even made that way. So they would be the least threatening thing that you would see. Like if they were flying by, you'd go, "Oh, they're not going to do anything to me." So keep that in mind. If you're out and a pteranodon comes up to you, just give it a good punch, and you'll be their, fine. Their feet look like our feet. Actually, they have like very. I can see if I can. They get walk out. very flat-footed. It's actually kind of cool. Um, but yeah, definitely. We had a student who asks, with technology today, would there ever be a chance for dinosaurs to be recreated? Um, which is interesting because, you know, today, everybody always asks, are, are, you know, birds or dinosaurs are extinct. But in fact, birds are, birds living today are dinosaurs. They are, um, they are biologically um, dinosaurs. They, they, they made it through the Cretaceous extinction or a group of them did and are alive today as birds. Um, but birds today still within their genome maintain some some genes that you see in dinosaurs. Like birds today don't have teeth. Um, we are able to go down to the genetic level. We able with, with certain you know tools go in and kind of so so to speak flip those switches where we have grown teeth in chicken embryos. Um, same thing with the tail. Dinosaurs have long tails. Uh, chickens don't, but that gene still exists. We can go in and flip that switch and we can grow tails. Now we don't grow them to, we don't, you know, they don't, we don't grow them to term. They don't hatch, but, uh, but those genes, a lot of those genes still exist within the genome. So whether we'll be able to ever clone a dinosaur is probably highly unlikely. Um, there are, I'm not going to say it will happen, um, but there's, I'd say the potential to recreate a dinosaur like organism. Um, anybody other thoughts? I think, yeah, cloning a dinosaur, the Jurassic Park way is, is, Probably, you can never say 100%, but DNA does not last that long. It has a very short half-life, and DNA is also destroyed by water, and so there's a lot of time and exposure to water over millions of years that dinosaur fossils existed. So I would say there are cutoffs for extinct animals for cloning, and so dinosaurs are well out of that cutoff. The fossils that we have of them are not bones anymore. They're, they're rocks. They're mineralized. Any of the biological material is pretty much completely uh, gone, even when you get brilliant preservation that's not true preservation of um, a lot of the biological tissues, though you can get biomolecules, I, I will say that, um, uh, colors 
and I don't know some other biomolecules, like, collagen, like, protein. and, like proteins, yeah. things like that. Not, but not clonable type material, but still really, really cool stuff in, in the fossil record. So I agree with Josh that our best chance is to create a dinosaur-like animal. Um, and even that is extremely challenging. Um, these animals do not hatch for the ones that we have kind of messed up a little bit. You also get the question with, if we could, should we? Oh. <laughs> so uh, a quick left turn here, but I'd like to go around the horn. Um, someone in Austin's class wants to know, one of the students wants to know, what is the rarest fossil that any of you have found? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be rare in terms of paleontological studies, but it could be rare for your work, et cetera, et cetera. So um, since we always seem to go this way, can we start with Scott this time? You want to pass? You can pass. The rarest fossil that, uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> Well, I, I would say that that Jane is probably one of one of the rarest. So that's a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, it is a dinosaur that is 20 feet long, seven feet tall, built very differently than an adult T. Rex. Uh, uh, where adult T. Rex is 40 feet long, you know, 12 to 14 feet tall at the hip, would have weighed eight, eight nine tons in life. Um, <clears throat> and there's only a not even a handful of good juvenile T-Rex specimens in the world uh, is that have skulls and skeletons. There's just maybe three or four now, something like that. Um, so I would probably say that's that's uh, that's the rarest for me. Um, I think the rarest fossils I've found, I found a baby direwolf puppy and then I found the skull of a crocodile in a drawer at a museum <laughs> um, that ended up being a new species and related to only one other that we have in the world that was dug up in the 1930s, survived World War II bombing of Munich. Um, and so we have two of these skulls um, that are related to one another, so that's pretty rare. In the same museum? No, oh. but that's okay. <laughs> When you're talking about dinosaur ecosystems, usually it's not the dinosaurs that are the rarest. It's things like mammals and then really delicate fossils. So the really thin bone things like the flying reptiles, the birds. And so I would say those are some of the rarest things I've found. One of those being uh, the only complete mammal skull from the Southern Hemisphere. So a skull that was found in Madagascar, totally by luck. So it's just in this chunk of rock. Uh, there were little bits of fish, dinosaur teeth coming out. So I just jacketed the whole rock, brought it back, uh, and we CT scanned it, and right in the middle of that rock was a complete mammal skull, still the most complete ever found. Wow. Um, I guess I think the coolest thing that I found myself was out in the Hell Creek Formation. So usually you find things like Triceratops and T-Rex, um, but I actually found a chunk of the skull of one of the head-butting dinosaurs, the Pachycephalosaurus. And even though they're like made of solid bone, we don't find them very often at all. So that was pretty cool. Cool. Um, I, I haven't found anything rare, and, and I've actually been asked this question before, and my brain always like turns off for it, but I I am comfortable, and I use for my research this really beautiful platycarpus specimen, which is a type of mosasaur. Um, it's the most complete platycarpus uh, known, I believe, and it has uh, soft tissue um, impressions in it, and a lot of mosasaurs do, but this, this is still cool. When I say a lot, it's still only a handful. And so it's really cool to see the skin impressions of what the skin looked like, as well as even the trachea. So you know, your windpipe and little tracheal rings. So I see that fossil every time I go into my museum. So yeah. I'd say honestly, some of the more rare things I've found uh, while digging would be like ankylosaurus teeth, really. Ankylosaurus is the armored dinosaur, the one with the giant tail club um, and, and looks like a, a tank with legs. Um, most people know what they look like, but they're actually very rare. Um, they're uncommon in the Hell Creek Formation. Um, usually you, you might find chunks of what we call osteoderms, uh, which were bone embedded within the tissue um, or teeth, but we don't find that many. We find that, uh, maybe one every two or three years, maybe. Um, so those are very rare, but kind of as Dr. Sertich was saying, it was the mammals are always rare. And some of these microvertebrates, microvertebrates what we call basically uh, microvertebrate uh, site is where you find teeth to small things, teeth or vertebrae, lizards, snakes, um, amphibians, frogs, salamanders, 
things like that. And a lot of those things, I mean, you, it's new species. When you find a new species, essentially you're finding something that's rare. It's never been uh, documented. So here at, here at the Burpee, actually, we do have a uh, on exhibit, we have a al little alligatoroid um, that we thought was a common uh, crocodilian in, in the Hell Creek Formation called Brachychamsa. Well, it turns out after studying, you know, some parts of this skeleton that it's 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 not a Brachychamsa. It's a different genus in 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 and of itself, and it's a different species within this gen genus. So we currently have a, uh, a, a former Burpee employee who works out in North Dakota now uh, working on that skeleton right now, which we'll hopefully publish in the near future. But that's so that, I mean, that would be considered rare um, as we know it right now, because um, it's the only one known. But, you know, so any, any there's lots out there, but that's probably my most rare. So, I wanted, oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead. Hun. I was there's a, there's a question from Austin. Um, what is the oldest fossil you personally found? I, I think I might be the person who found the oldest one because I work in a lab full of geobiologists. It's a very, I work in a very broad group. And so I've been out to Ediacaran rocks and I found some stromatolites. Um, these are like some of the oldest evidence of life right before the Cambrian explosion, before um, our modern groups of organisms diversified and exploded. And so it was very microbial mat dominated. And I've had the privilege of being able to look at um, some 2.5 billion year old uh, rocks in, in one of my um, committee members lab. So I've, I've seen some of the oldest evidence of life known, and I've had uh, the privilege of being able to find my old little Ediacaran schematolite and uh, take it home in a very alien world that Earth was when those, those mats formed. So yeah. Awesome. So what I'd like to do is you guys have each shared some photographs and slides and whatnot from your work. And so I'm just going to put some up and if it's yours, chat away and tell us what we're looking at. Oh, no. <laughs> I figured this was a good one to start oh, wow. with. That looks like me. Um, this is an, a gharial, an Indian gharial. It is dead. Um, this is Louise. She was at the Fort Worth Zoo in Texas and passed away a couple years ago. And they called me down to come down and, and kind of learn from her. Uh, gharials are super endangered crocodile relatives that live in India. And we actually have a few in zoos here in the United States. But I got to come down and work on this. But you can see this lab. There are some bighorn sheep in the background. There's a table next to me on, the, on, on my right there with a, also a black bag. And inside of that bag is a cassowary. And cassowaries are um, Australian relatives of uh, ostriches with big blue heads and big killer feet. And I got to kind of check that out that day too. Oh no, me again. <laughs> um, you all might know this. This is Sue up at the Field Museum. Um, this is actually, now that I'm old and I have my own students, I bring my students up to the field museum and they pull Sue out of the, the casework and stuff when we get to get up underneath her and check out the inside of her mouth and do all that. So that's super cool. So here I was making a lot of field museum people very impatient while uh, <laughs> I got to do my thing. <laughs> oh, this is me. So uh, I, like I said, I'm a research associate or graduate student in residence at the Dinosaur Institute, the Natural History Museum of LA County. And so this is what all of our fossils look like when they're in drawers. So when paleontologists go visit the collections, you pull out your drawer, you look for your specimens. And so I'm there smiling in front of some Plotosaurus material. Plotosaurus is a Mosasaur um, from the uh, Pacific Ocean at the time of the dinosaur. So not very well understood ecology, um, ecological region. And you can't see it quite there, but that's the um, uh, pectoral girdle or the shoulder girdle element, so all the bones that anchor your upper limbs. Uh, and I, I, I love that specimen. I open it up just for funsies whenever I go in sometimes. <laughs> oh boy, so then that's, uh, so this is me with another Mosasaur fossil. And um, <laughs> this is a Tylosaurus. This is a North American Mosasaur from the Western Interior Seaway. So the Western Interior Seaway was a shallow, warm sea that basically connected the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Ocean, so it cut North America right in half. Um, Bunker is lovely because its skull, as you can see, is as long as I am tall, so about 5'7", and the entire skeleton is about 46 feet long, which I like to point out is larger than any T-Rex that's ever been found. <laughs> oh, good, it's me again. Um, so this is fun. I love this skull. This is me taking pictures of the holotype skull of Tylosaurus cancesensis. So this is a different species that lived before the species that Bunker was. Um, this skull is a topic of a little bit of a debate in Mosasaurus, which I'll actually be talking about tomorrow here at PaleoFest. Um, so it's been proposed that because it's kind of small um, and some bone shapes look like they could be juvenile shapes, that it's actually the juvenile of another species of Tylosaurus that lived at the same 
roughly the same time and roughly the same place. Um, so yeah, so I'm taking some good good pictures of it in the display case there. Oh man, <laughs> uh, that's me. Uh, I am bending my back because I'm teaching my intern there how to swing a pickaxe. So you can see that we've cut into the ground. There's a bunch of lines in the really hard sand. Um, those were cut with a diamond bladed rock saw. And then to pop those out, you have to whack at them with a, a big pickaxe. And so he was kind of noodle arming those things. I had to teach him how to put his back into it. That's what I'm doing there. <laughs> Where was this? This is in New Mexico. This is called the Fruitland Formation. So this is in Northwestern New Mexico. I think we're digging up plants. <laughs> Oh, that's uh, one of mine. <laughs> Apparently, um, there aren't any people in this. Those are all alligators um, being Im viewed using um, thermal imaging camera, so wow. we can see which parts of them are cold versus which parts of them are hot. Awesome. It is awesome. Don't go in there. Oh wait, no. I sorry. <laughs> is it this one? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Hi. This is my ammonite. This is the first fossil I found in the field. I found this at the Triassic Jurassic boundary in Nevada, which is really cool because I could literally walk from the Triassic where there's an extinction happening and there's no life. And then I just step into the Jurassic and then there's life. And this is a uh, early Jurassic ammonite right after the life and the ocean started to recover from that extinction. And it's one of my favorite finds. Is this me or Scott? Oh, that's, oh, that's you, bro. <laughs> that's for me. So this is a. Uh... Uh, our, our Hanksville Burpee Dinosaur Quarry out in uh, Hanksville, Utah. So this is we do pu public tours there every every uh, summer uh, for a couple weeks, and it's it's an active quarry that uh, the dirt the dirt road, which is actually a county road, actually dead ends at the quarry. So uh, during during the summer when we're out there, people can drive out. We give them tours of uh, our crews working in the quarry, show them actual bones coming out of the ground, um, and this is. Uh, Steve Landy is one of our crew members, a former board member here to the right with a uh, red bandana under his hat. And this is just a, uh, a tourist group that came out. And I think that's John Heller behind me in the center there. So this is our, yeah. Oh, wait, I just almost put a Jurassic Park image up. That'd be good. <laughs> oh, that's me again. Uh, that is a respirator because when you do those cuts in the hard sand stones, so this is in New Mexico again, you have to block out all of that really bad dust. There's stuff like silica that can really damage your lungs. So we have to wear the heavy duty protection. And the one thing I've taken off is my ear protection. That's what you're also supposed to wear when you run those big heavy saws. Oh. Sorry you're blurry, but we're focusing, I think, on the, the <clears throat> fossil. Um, okay, so that is, that's me in the lab here. It's a few years ago. My hair is much darker and thicker. That's, uh, that's cool. Um, <laughs> and uh, what I'm holding there, I believe, is a cross-section of a toe bone to a meat-eating dinosaur, a theropod dinosaur uh, called Anzu. Anzu is an oviraptorosaur, so kind of like a giant uh, giant parent on steroids that, that was running around at the same time as T-Rex and Triceratops. And what I'm showing is that the bone is hollow in the cross section. So uh, one of the characters that, uh, physical characters that we see in meat, meat eating dinosaurs that, sh that shares with birds is um, um, it, hollow bones. Uh, in this case, I think there's also trabecular bone there. So there's this kind of spider webby bone in there, which we also see in birds. Um, and so, uh, so one of hundreds of characters that uh, theropod dinosaurs share with modern birds. Oh, okay, so this was really fun, a really fun day for me. So this is right behind where the drawers I was shown before, and this is the this is Plotosaurus. Um, this is the entire axial column. I counted, I believe this was like eighty-three vertebrae and these are not in the proper order so it's not in the order of like neck versus trunk versus tail i was in the process of setting it all setting them all out then i was going to order them this was a very long animal and i photographed a bunch of these bones and i actually left this on the table for like three months and then finally our collections manager was like hey, can we put the mosasaur away please there are other visiting researchers coming so uh that's that's a that's big mosasaur <laughs> spinal column awesome so we go from big to small there's josh Oh, yeah. Jaw. I think we got a little. It's a jaw. Yeah, a little guard jaw, maybe? Uh, or is it a salamander? I can't remember. Yeah, we have a lot, a lot of microsites out in the Hell Creek Formation. This is this is actually a site Scott found very beginning, right? This is Scott's microsite, 2001. 
And this yeah. is one of those sites where you literally lay on the ground and look for tiny little fossils laying at the surface or, or coming out coming out of the sediments and you get all kinds of things like like i mentioned earlier salamanders frogs crocodile um lots of fish so these were these are aquatic ecosystems rivers and streams and lakes and so you get a lot of fossils from fish and fish have a lot of vertebrae and uh, garfish in particular have a lot of scales so one of the most common things we find out there our fish vertebrae and fish scales to the point we don't want to collect them anymore because we have thousands and thousands of them already um but yeah you, they're, they're cool they're actually really kind of therapeutic when you're you, you're not finding anything you just find these spots lay on the ground and just focus really intently at the little things they might be little rocks but you can find little mammal teeth all kinds of things so they're fun all right are there any other questions or items that you guys want to address before we wrap, because we're nearly out of time. What is your hardest animal fossil to identify? Um, this is actually a good question because I have a, a microvertebrate uh, from one of these sites that I have absolutely no idea what it is. I can't tell if it's a fish or it's probably a fish because it looks, it looks weird. Usually when you get weird toothy like things, they turn out to be fish, but a lot of things are hard to identify. I mean, that's why most, most of us specialize in in certain groups of animals we don't know everything so that's when we find something we don't know what it is take a picture and uh, send it to a colleague of yours that kind of works on what you think that might be and and ask them hey what that come what, what am i looking at <laughs> so I, I that that's that's one for me i'm still puzzled to what it is and it's about about that big maybe <laughs> i got some more pictures of your micro fossils if you want sure so someone asked what the first dinosaur would be discovered was like first recorded dinosaur. Was it a megalosaurus, megalosaurus or yeah, me megalosaurus in, in the United Kingdom. Um, that was the first dinosaur. And then I think iguanodons really, a lot of those crystal palace dinosaurs are portrayed early um, in Jersey, my home state. Uh, the first mounted dinosaur skeleton was Hadrosaurus foci and that's the state dinosaur of Jersey. So uh, a lot of, a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Early dinos. All right, here we go. I'm pulling them up. I'm only so fast, though. So um, other comments was the smallest animal fossil. I mean, I, I don't know. This is probably for you, Josh, right? I'll throw those pictures up. But you did, I mean, you talked about the pollen, but yeah, that's yeah. not animal. Yeah, and I, the smallest animals would be frogs for me, probably frogs. I mean, frogs are, yeah, their bones are so delicate, and they're really weird, especially their skull bones. In fact, to the point where most... You know, if I have a, a vertebrate, a dinosaur or even mosasaur or whatever, typically you can get an idea of, of what bone it is based on the shape and, and some of its articulation points. But uh, that's palatal. A really weird part. Yeah, that, so this is a, the palatal teeth to um, a fish. So they had the, on the on the roof of their mouth, they had teeth. You get lots of chunks of these out there. There's a little fish vertebrae. Well, let me take my question off. There's a, there's a scale. Yeah. That's a gar scale. So the cool thing about gar scales, I mean, gar fish live today. You can find them in the, in the rivers and streams around uh, Rockford. And they have changed very little since the, the end of the Cretaceous. So we, we can take uh, this, this scale right here. I can take it in back to our biology collections. And we have a, a mounted gar fish. And you can, it looks exactly the same. And you can find out where it belongs on the body based off its shape. Um, so these things are the ones you find by the thousands everywhere. <laughs> Really quick, I know they might have gone already. They said thank you, but for Yuri Moctezuma's class for Brooklyn, I'd like to know what's the largest fossil tooth dino you have found. I haven't found one, but I, I well, Tyrannosaurus teeth are the size of bananas. I, does mm -hmm. it get bigger than that? Like any any herbivores have flat, big chewing teeth, or well, I found a mammoth tooth before. A mammoth, yeah, yeah, mammoth teeth. Yeah, mammoth teeth are huge. Are yeah, yeah. So T-Rex are the biggest, yeah, yeah. So are the biggest and big mammoth teeth. So if you're still there, those are the biggest teeth. And, and, and Ann over here found the biggest Tyrannosaurus rex tooth we've, I think, found here at the museum last year. We've already discussed this. Yeah, I didn't I didn't find it. Josh was, I was doing the thing, um, digging around near a Ceratopsian frill, having a very good time. And then this thing and kind of it fell out. It was in my way for my very specific purpose. And Josh is like, oh, my gosh. And I was like, this is garbage. And he's like, no, it's a tooth. <laughs> Whoops. It's pretty though. It was, it was beautiful. Yeah, it was it's just really awesome. it, was a, it was a shed tooth. It wasn't. It didn't have the root in it, but it was. It was a big boy. 
I think for tiniest fossil, I found a bat elbow or part of a bat elbow. Really? Right before. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's gonna that be tiny. Cool. When the, Josh, explain what happens when they're so tiny, or you can explain like that they just like static electric oh, themselves yeah. to everything, and you. Yeah, we put them in. Well, at least I do. I put them in plastic containers, and just the static electricity from the container will suck these things right up, and they'll stick to the lid. <laughs> and you don't want to sneeze or or breathe too hard around them either, because they'll just go flying. <laughs> Yeah, or just go flying when you won't be able to find them, especially if you have carpet on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Don't vacuum like you're vacuuming up Legos. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, um, thank you to everyone who has participated today. This has been another successful symposium. We're so glad that so many teachers locally bring their kids together to watch and listen and comment and ask questions. And it's such a wonderful opportunity to have these amazing people here in Rockford. Um, if the whole weekend they'll be here plus a whole lot more. So come see us down at the Burpee Museum and we will be looking forward to teaching you all things prehistoric. So bye. I also want to quick oh. thank, I also like to quick thank the uh, the panel up here. Uh, we brought these guys in a day early uh, from Paleo Fest so they could sit here and talk to you guys. We took a day out of their time. I particularly want to thank Amelia here. We <laughs> pulled her away from a very important specimen at her museum that she uh, uh, hope, hopefully got all the information she needed because I don't know if she'll get a chance to do that again. So um, just break the class. Yeah, right, right. So thank you, thank you everybody for coming out and and spending this day with us and 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 the students. I really, we, Ann and I and the museum really appreciate that. Thank you guys. Have a great day. <laughs>